Hello everybody, my name is Fauzi and I'm here to talk to you about effective prototyping. Before we dive into the topic, let me tell you a little bit about myself. So my name is Fauzi and I'm a game designer. I've been working in game design for around 17 years now. I started my career in Jordan, where, where, where me and my friends uh, got together and created an independent group of developers. And we started working on a Game Boy Advance there. I've since worked with a bunch of other developers uh, in that region. Uh, we worked on uh, an Xbox 360 game, PC game, worked on PHP games, uh, worked on music trivia games uh, for Facebook. I worked on a very stereotypical um, farming game. And uh, also collaborated with Atlas uh, Studios in both Bangkok and Tokyo, and we released uh, Persona 3 Social. From Jordan, I took a small detour to New Zealand, where I joined Gameloft. Uh, this is a picture of myself with uh, my little pony team and the Prime Minister of uh, New Zealand at the time, Mr. John Key. Uh, my Little Pony was one of the most successful games for Gameloft uh, at that year, one of the most successful uh, games uh, grossing-wise for New Zealand at the time, which is why the Prime Minister had to come over and see where all this money is coming from. Since then, we worked on a bunch of different um, IP-based games. Uh, worked on uh, Ice Age Adventures, here's a picture of me with a bunch of penguins, uh, Littlest Pet Shop, A Pastry Paradise, worked on the game tie-in for The Amazing Spider-Man 2, then we collaborated with our studios in Spain into delivering uh, the game with a uh, tie-in for Despicable Me 2 called Minion Rush. Minion Rush is on the list of the top 10 most downloaded game of all time for iOS and Android. From New Zealand, I took another detour to Japan, uh, where I joined Inish. Inish is an independent studio that does a lot of co-development with other Japanese studios, such as Square Enix, Gree, and Glue Mobile. I was based in Tokyo. I worked with mostly Japanese development team, and we released a whole bunch of uh, games for the Japanese market. You probably never heard of most of these, but I'll tell you about them anyway. Sinem Yokyushin, 12 Odins, Yurukami, Kruton, and other, uh, others based on mangas that were released mostly in, in Japan. From Japan, I took another detour all the way to Germany where I joined King. I was head of design and production uh, in the Berlin studio. Uh, we we're also known as the studio with the slide, which is the best method of transportation between the second floor and the first floor. We were looking after the Candy Crush franchise, Candy Crush Jelly Saga, Candy Crush Saga, and we also did some development work on Candy Crush Friends Saga. And this is a picture of uh, Angela Merkel when she was visiting our studio and made a Candy Crush level. From Germany, I took the smallest detour to date when I moved to Sweden and Stockholm and enjoyed DICE. Yay. I'm head of design of DICE, so I look after all of, uh, uh, all of the designers at the studio. That includes game designers, level designers, UX designers, etc. It's a team of over 85 people. I'm also responsible for the design and the creative output of both the Battlefield and the Battlefront franchises. The latest two releases of Star Wars Battlefront 2 and Battlefield 5 on uh, PC, PlayStation 4, and Xbox One. A um, couple of years ago, I released my first textbook uh, called Al Khalab fi Fantasmim al Arab or Al Khalab on the Art of Game Design. This is the first textbook to be written about game design in Arabic. Uh, I've, I wrote this to help um, people that want to get into game development from the region without having to learn a second language first. It's not the first book I worked on. I worked on a bunch of comic books before, nine of them to be uh, uh, exact. Uh, it was maybe around 11 years ago. I co-authored uh, nine comic books to create local heroes for the region. Combined, they sold around 5 million copies. I, I like to talk and to present and to lectures about game design. So I, I do lectures in universities in every country I, I've lived in. I did uh, universities, in, I did the lectures in the Auckland University of Science and Technology, in the Berlin Games Academy, um, in the SAE. I, uh, I also now did uh, game design courses in future games here in Stockholm. I'm a, I'm a jury member of the International Mobile Games Award. I'm also a jury member of the Game Developers Choice Awards. I am a Google mentor. That means I collaborate with Google up to three times a year um, to meet up with uh, smaller and uh, smaller companies and indie developers, look at their products and give them some advice. I also co-established the IGDA chapter in Berlin during my time there. 
Um, so enough about me. Let's talk about prototyping. Let's start by talking about what prototyping actually is. So prototyping is basically trying to create a working model of an idea so that basically allows the designer to test uh, if that idea works or not. So that means that you need to remove everything that is uh, uh, distracting from what the gameplay idea is, what the, the essence of the idea is, and focusing on just creating a rough approximation of the artwork and sounds with the highlight being on the playable part of the game or the, the, the part that needs testing. Uh, why doing that? Because when you're making a prototype, you're not being concerned with all elements that relate to production. So you don't have to be concerned about how it looks, what technology we're going to use. Is it optimized or not? How good is it running? All of that stuff. All you're worrying about is, uh, is the hypothesis that we had before starting this prototype being true or not. So basically it's about focusing if it's a mechanic, does this sustain the interest of people or the play testers? Um, uh, is the design that we're putting together solid? Are we delivering the experiences that we think we're going to deliver with that gameplay experiences? The idea with prototyping is to be faster and cheaper than actually testing this stuff during production. Because uh, once you start building the actual game, uh, this could be quite expensive and making these uh, changes or alterations would cost a lot of money and effort. And in, the, in like more extreme cases, could be a blocker for the project as a whole. There are many different methods of prototyping. I'm going to mention uh, 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 four of them, uh, visual prototyping, physical prototyping, and uh, digital or software prototyping. Physical prototyping is the easiest type of prototype. Uh, most game developers can be able to conduct themselves. Uh, they're basically create, uh, created using uh, pieces of paper, cardboard, uh, whatever household object you can uh, get your hands on and writing, writing notes on those markers and whatnot. Uh, the benefits of these is that it allows you to focus on the gameplay rather than technology, allows for easier and faster iterations. Um, they're very cheap. They're most, mostly built of household products uh, and items that you have available to you. Uh, the team is less likely to be attached since it's not a video game. When they want to start building the game, the physical prototype is likely to be shelved or thrown away within, without any attachment from the game team themselves. And you can respond in real time to player feedback. As you play testing the game with others, you can start, oh, that was too powerful. All right, let's make the three and two. And then you make the adjustment on the paper right then and there. Or like, oh, one dice is not in enough for uh, measuring the randomness, add another one and throw it and like make that kind of adjustment. So you can respond in real time to, um, to the player feedback as you're going through that. And uh, also this allows even non-technical team members to take part and participate in the design process. So um, anybody can, uh, from the team can take part in designing this game, which will allow us for a lot more fun and accessibility and uh, a lot more heads to be joined in. Uh, these are some examples of physical prototyping. The one on the left is like a typical representation of a dungeon crawler when uh, you can have a, a bunch of the stats written on the paper and you have a grid to represent movement and you have a lot of different types of objects um, that are using to represent what the dungeon is, for example. Um, the picture on the right, it's a little bit of an extreme case, but I thought, I thought to mention it to be interesting. This is uh, Hideo Kojima working on Metal Gear 2. Uh, and the construction of Metal Gear, the first one, um, he was giving a lot of feedback to the programmers about adjusting camera angles while they're working on the game. He was kind of frustrated because he couldn't get his creative vision across without having to go through a lot of other programmers um, to get the ideas across. So in, in developing Metal Gear 2, they built a lot of the... Uh, the levels layout in Lego so that they can have a very good idea and understanding of the of the game space and how things are moving towards that. And they also added the technology in which they gave him the camera, which is by his right hand, that he used to uh, to capture the keyframes of the cutscenes through that uh, Lego model and that translated into the game as well. So it allowed for faster iteration on multiple avenues. Uh, obviously now there are much faster and easier ways to build um, models that doesn't require you to build Lego, but I thought it's an interesting um, example to give around using physical models. General tips for physical prototyping, please don't pay any attention to the quality of the artwork, the sound and the music or whatever. Don't, uh, don't bother with like drawing nice drawings on these cards or like making the board laminated or anything of the sort. The idea is that it's crude and, and cheap 
so that you can make as much alterations as possible. Once you put together a prototype, play it yourself to make sure that you get an understanding about how the physical prototyping is functioning and you capture all the easy mistakes to capture and then start inviting others to join you for those quick iterations. Uh, start playing testing with others, um, uh, capture their feedback and make the iterations. Sometimes on the spot, sometimes uh, uh, we can make it in between sessions. Uh, many people ask me like, how do we represent um, actual uh, real-time uh, elements in, in prototyping. Physical prototyping is capable of doing that because you can use dice or cards to represent random elements. You can use grids to represent movements and you can use turns to represent time. So we can always find different ways to, uh, to capture whatever gameplay concept you have in a physical form. Visual prototyping is a different type of prototyping in which like you can just sketch your uh, uh, visualization on a piece of paper or on a whiteboard and gives like a very rough diagram or representation of the core actions uh, for the game prototype. So if you've ever like stood in on a whiteboard and started sketching something to explain your ideas to other, then you've, you've done some kind of form of visual prototyping. One of the types of visual prototyping is storyboards. This is quite common in um, the movie industry or the animation industry in which uh, it represents multiple ideas through a comic book style fashion to demonstrate how, uh, how the actions is happening through time. Uh, this is uh, this can potentially be used when you're trying to uh, prototype animation-based gameplay, or like if you're trying to put the several combos in a row, how would they potentially look like over a frame of time, or like multiple shots within a scene? A storyboard is a very good way to uh, to to do the the visualization of how that looks, make alterations before actually starting building the thing. Concept art is another form of visual prototyping. It's basically, uh, there's so much information that you can get from the concept art. This is a piece of concept art from Uncharted 4. Uh, uh, people can, like uh, the game dev team from looking at this can get a lot of ideas about like what uh, objects they should create for that particular scene, the scale of those objects compared to the character, the lighting, the mood, the general atmosphere of the scene. Uh, so it's much easier to create different types of concept art, so alterations of the concept art until you capture the right feel before translating it into the, the, the game engine rather than doing it the other way around. So concept art guides an entire team towards a common goal, which is a very valuable thing to achieve. Um, animatic is another different type, which is a step forward from storyboards. It's basically getting uh, the different panels or key frames of an animation to uh, run over a, a space of time. And that's just to give a close approximation of how a particular action or movement is going to take place over a period of time. This is particularly valuable in trying to explain some complex mechanic that requires a lot of different movement uh, that uh, will take place over a particular amount of time. And designers will be able to alter that uh, based on the needs. This is probably, a, this is a science of its own and a topic of its own prototyping and visual prototyping of UI versus, uh, and wireframes is a long topic that is beyond the scope of this presentation, but I thought it's uh, worth of mentioning uh, just because of how important it is to test usabilities and whatnot through very, a lot of different means of visual and physical prototyping when it comes to UI. Uh, then it's digital prototyping. This is everybody's favorite. Most people would, uh, are tempted when they start the prototyping process to jump directly into digital prototyping, though I would advise you to try to use as much of the uh, prototyping from the previous two before jumping in here. Uh, this is where you want to build models of what the core systems that you have questions about, uh, such as game logic, uh, special physics, environments, whatever that uh, this game is trying to, uh, to capture, this is where you want to try to find the questions that you don't have answers for and build a working model of those and then see if that works before. Uh, as with every type of prototyping, I need to also emphasize this again, uh, when you're building digital prototypes, you're building them with minimal arts or sound. Only use the things that you need. What you're trying to do is to test if something is working. Uh, and uh, you need to identify what is the thing you're trying to test and therefore only prototype that. The gameplay doesn't have to be complete. On the contrary, the gameplay should only be uh, testing the thing that you're trying to identify. So basically try to identify what are your unanswered questions and the parts of the design that need further clarity and that is the part that you're digitally pro prototyping. Uh, 
digital prototype does not always mean that it has to be through engine. In fact, like the, if you have trying to uh, prototype mechanics that involve number crunching, you can sometimes just build an entire prototype in Excel. So like, for example, if you're trying to see if a virtual economy works, you can build the entire thing in Excel and through some scripts over there. Uh, another tip that I would give for digital prototyping is that try to always prototype in a different language than the one you're gonna be developing the game in. The reason for that is that if you are developing in a different language, you're less likely to make that prototype into the game. So you're le more likely to throw it away and start from scratch uh, clear. The reason that you don't want to do that is that if you build on top of badly structured code or pipelines, and then that becomes the game, then later down the line in production, you, you will inherit those bad pipelines and it will make your life a nightmare. So you probably want to start fresh and clean once you answer the questions and prototyping in another language helps in doing that. Um, digital prototyping is most effective when it's done in small and fast throwaway projects. So uh, you need to break down the problem into small chunks and then do rapid iterations on that. That is called rapid prototyping. So that means that when you pose the question about some aspect of your game, you come up with a solution or a potential solution for that, then you try to validate as quickly as possible uh, by building a model of that solution and then validate if that works or not. If it doesn't work, you make an alterations and then you propose a new solution and you start prototyping again. Um, so you want to make that as quick, as quick and fast as possible to be able to get the results. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, digital prototyping does not necessarily need to be in game engine. I mentioned Excel sheet as one way of uh, prototyping. There are many different other ways you can uh, use uh, any kind of programming language to program or write uh, digital software. You can use any game engine. Uh, most of the game engines are now free to download so you can test on stuff on that if you don't want to use on your proprietary engine. Um, many games ship with level editors. You can potentially use those level editors as well to test or prototype new gameplay ideas or even build new gameplay ideas entirely. Um, Dota was famously a Warcraft 3 mod, so um, that was a level editor that shipped with the game that came out in 2003 or something like that. So there's many different ways in which you can uh, affect uh, or effectively prototype using tools that are uh, released already. If you're trying to prototype a, a, a 2D platformer, you can probably test a lot of your ideas on a Mario Maker level. But also you can use 3D software such as, or sketch to create visual uh, representations of spaces and they make alterations to that space or whatnot. So the, all these are just tools. The most importantly is to, is to try to make the, the, the prototyping around the right aspect of the development cycle. So as I worked with the uh, prototyping teams throughout the years, I've, I've observed a bunch of common mistakes that I want to list up in the stock so that uh, I point your attention towards them. Uh, one of the most common mistakes is that uh, teams don't allow time for prototyping so that they just jump directly into start building the game because most people are just excited about building it. So they put a bunch of theoretical design on paper and then they jump directly into building the game to implementation. That means that there's a lot of unanswered questions on the design. So if there's any design that you've never seen or experienced before, then that's likely is going to pop up during production. And that means that during while you're producing the game at full speed with like the full team, um, you you will hit spots in which like, oh, we don't know how that works or we don't think this will work. And then you'll have to make iterations on that. So that creates uh, a, a more expensive and slow production phase. So uh, most people are excited to, you know, to jump into building, which is the fun part of making games. But uh, that means if you don't have time for prototyping, then you don't, did not do your time properly in planning. And whatever uh, time unspent in planning is gonna show up in implementation. There's no way around it. Mistake number two is the opposite of this one is just prototyping indefinitely. So that, that means that you're assuming that whatever idea you have, you're gonna constantly iterate on it until it work. That means that you think that your design must work. Uh, and that, that will cause problems because any design can always be improved. So the best way to tackle that idea of iterating or prototyping forever is you time box your prototyping phase. So you set a prerequisite time of this is the amount of time I'm gonna be spending uh, prototyping and then whatever happens after that, I'm gonna to have to move on. So having an open-ended time spent on an idea causes a massive slow in, uh, in production. And sometimes, you know, teams spend ages in prototyping and they end up eating in their production times and never releasing, so. 
Um, you don't want you don't want either mistake one or two. You need to find the right sweet spot in between. Uh, this is a very common mistake is that not having clear goals to prototyping. So like when you start prototyping, a lot of teams also jump into building uh, directly without think without having to stop to think why they're prototyping. Why are they prototyping? Uh, how do we know that this prototype is six? What is our method to measuring uh, the prototype? What is our me measurements to validate the success of the prototype? And no saying that I want to see if something fun or not is not uh, is not a goal that you set. I want to tell you an anecdote about something that happened when I worked with a prototyping team that uh, fell into this mistake. We were trying to prototype a new meta around the rhythm game idea. So the game idea was that, um, you know, it's like Guitar Hero with the notes highway coming towards the screen. You need to tap at the right time when the note comes towards a certain line. But uh, the innovation I tried to come up with around that game is like maybe a different type of meta or progression layer. And we had a couple of weeks to prototype. So the team spent a lot of the time in prototyping. What they did, they jumped immediately into building without planning. And the first thing they did is that they built the notes highway. They spent so much time working on like, you know, making the notes highway work, the notes coming towards the screen and then tapping at the right time to get those ideas across. Even one of the programmers spent an entire evening composing a new track um, that they used specifically for the demo. And then they aligned the thing for it. Then when it comes to reviewing the prototype, uh, we played the game, the music was nice, and you tap on the right time uh, with the notes highway. Uh, but from a validation purpose, that uh, that demo uh, did not uh, was not useful at all because um, it only showed us that the notes highway is fun, but we already know that because we've seen it in all the other games. So like in terms of presenting us with new information, it presented us with absolutely nothing true, nothing new. And the team uh, spent a lot of time uh, building something that was not useful instead of stopping and figuring out why we're prototyping and what are we trying to prototype and how do we know that we succeeded then. Uh, mistake number four is falling in love with your own idea so that basically you start to, uh, that's mean when you like your idea or your solution so much that you start to iterate to succeed instead of to fail. Prototyping, the object of it is to see if something is working or not. And this is a big emphasis on the not part. When you're falling in love with your own idea, then you're more likely to try to iterate time and time again to make sure that you are succeeding. That means that uh, you will not give up on something that is not working, even if it's clear that it's not working. And that means that you're also most likely to ignore feedback from others, even if it's staring you directly in the face. So if people are obviously telling you that it's not working, but you've already fallen in love with your idea, you're more likely to ignore what people are saying and to continue to work on the thing you wanted to work on. Uh, polishing a prototype is a very common mistake. I've mentioned it multiple times already in this talk. If you spent a lot of time in making the art or the sound uh, cool, then you've wasted a lot of effort for no real reason. You are not focusing on what was really matters. And it also makes it harder to throw it away because you spent so much time going like, I just spent so much time making it look nice. Therefore, maybe I should build the game on top if it's a digital prototype, or maybe I should not throw it away. And it also leads to mistake number four. It leads to people falling in love with their own ideas and that and whatever problems that come with that. Um, I also mentioned that in the programming with a different language, prototyping becomes a product. If you spend so much time or using the same tech to build the prototype, it becomes very tempting for you to just build on what you already have rather than starting from scratch. Uh, so using throwaway stuff as part of your production pipeline is tempting, but that means that you will also pay the price later on in the development and the production of the game. Uh, most likely a lot of people will pay the price and will slow down the prices and it's going to be needed to be fixed and uh, that's going to be a problem down the line. Uh, prototyping the wrong thing. I've mentioned that in an anecdote that I mentioned earlier when the team focused on the notes highway. Choosing the wrong part of the projects to validate is one of the most common mistakes in prototyping because you don't get as much learning. And it's, uh, it's typical because we almost always want to do the fun things first, so we're more likely to jump into building uh, the game rather than spending the time enough to validate what we want to validate first. Um, so to avoid that, I want to give you like a general, uh, 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 um, how do I say it, like approach or activity that you can do in your team to find out what you want to prototype. So first of all, you get your team together and you draw this on the whiteboard and then on the x-axis you write in what's uncertain to most certain. Then you start distributing a bunch of sticky notes to your team members. You ask your team members to write down the features of the game that you're building. Each uh, feature is a sticky note. Then you ask your team members to distribute those sticky notes with the features on them on the x-axis. 
from uncertain features to certain. And by certain, I mean these are features that you know work or like you've seen working in some other way before. And uncertain, these are features that have not been proven either by competitors or by prototyping. The second phase is that on uh, y-axis, you start uh, writing from critical to most critical, and then you take these features and you move them up and down the y-axis uh, based on how critical they are to the game. So that means if a, if a feature is critical, means that the game cannot chip without it. And then you will get that distribution on, uh, on the, the quadrant. The features that are uncertain and most critical to the game is exactly what you need to prototype. These are the things that the game cannot ship without, but at the same time, you are the most uncertain about. These are the things you need to prototype first. The things that are critical are certain. Those are the things that you know you need to ship, but also those are like the things you're banking on. The things that are certain are not, uh, not critical. Those are the nice to haves. Those are the things that you know would work, but the project doesn't really need them. And the things that are uh, not certain and uh, uncertain and not critical, that quadrant is the why are we even doing this? Um, those are things that are not useful for the game and at the same time very risky. Then we should really reconsider the, the use of these at all. So the conclusions of this talk is that prototyping is awesome. You need to use the method that gives you the quickest results. Quick and dirty is good, is what you want to achieve uh, or accomplish with prototyping. Uh, you need to work fast, but you need to work fast with a purpose. You need to know exactly what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how you're trying to validate that, and then find the quickest and dirtiest way to achieve that. And you want to fail just as much as you want to succeed. The, the, the objective of prototyping is not to come up with something deliverable, it's to come up with knowledge of whether that thing works or not. So uh, 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 good luck, enjoy prototyping, and thank you for uh, listening to my talk. Please feel free to get in touch. This is my Twitter handle at the end of the presentation.